Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming today. I'm Laura Burkhalter, Senior Curator here at the Des Moines Arts Center. Um, this is the last program for Transform Any Room, the exhibition that's upstairs in our Meredith Gallery. I hope that you've all had a chance to see it. That exhibition is inspired by domestic objects and notions of home, so um, I think it's really fitting that for our last program we are welcoming two artists who live here in Iowa with us um, in our home. Um, I'll let you in on a little bit of a secret. I know a lot of you come to these a lot and you see me or you see Jill or you see another staff person introduce the artists. A lot of times we just met that artist like a couple hours before them, <laughs> before we got up here and introduced them, but I'm very happy to say that both of these artists came to the Art Center and spent time in our galleries installing work, um, working with our staff here at the museum and really welcomed us into their work process and their practice. Getting to watch artists work is one of my favorite parts um, of my job, but I, I really want to say thank you to both TJ and Ange for um, letting, letting our staff and letting me be the caretakers of your work because it's been an awesome experience to work with both of you. So I'll say thank you again later, but really thank you, thank you now for that. Um, I'm gonna do a little rundown of the program today. So as soon as I'm through with my introduction, Ange Altenhofen will come up and speak, and then we'll go directly into a film by TJ Dino Norris, and then we will all be on stage for some questions, and then we'll have time for you all to ask questions. But before we get there, a brief, some brief introductions of our prestigious artists here today. Ange Altenhofen is based in Sheridan, Iowa. She has an MFA degree from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Her work has been exhibited both nationally and internationally, um, including at the MCA Chicago, the National Museum of Women in the Arts, and the Hyde Park Art Center. Um, when she returned to Iowa in 2015, she was named an Iowa Artist Fellow in 2019. She received a New York Foundation for the Arts grant, grant and a Robert Rauschenberg Foundation grant in 2021. In 2023, she was awarded a project grant from the National Endowment for the Arts and the Iowa Arts Council to create the, the sculpture that I just spoke about her installing here for Transform Your Room called Grotto. Um, if you haven't gone up there to see it and crawled around, around it, please do um, after this. TJ Dido Norris completed their BA at the University of California at Los Angeles and their MFA at Yale University. Their work has been presented internationally at the Contemporary Arts Museum Houston, Mission Creek Festival, National Museum of Art, Performa, Prospect New Orleans, the Rotterdam Film Festival, and the Studio Museum in Harlem, and the Sundance Film Festival, among other institutions. Dido Norris has participated in residencies at the Grant Wood Art Colony in 2016 to 2017, and is a 2019-2020 Pollock Krasner Foundation grantee and a 2022 Iowa Artist Fellow. Um, TJ is a tenured professor at, tenured associate professor, should be full professor, at the University of Iowa. <laughs> uh, so please help me welcome Ange and TJ to the stage and get your questions ready. Thank you very much. Hello everyone. My name is Ange Altenhofen. And I want to thank the um, Des Moines Arts Center and Laura Burkhalter um, for being such a good sport and having me, or letting me install a giant pillow fort <laughs> in the exhibition upstairs. Um, this has been a huge honor for me, so I really appreciate that. Okay, so um, this is a label from one of my exhibitions recently. Um, and uh, the curator was, we were talking about how my work is interactive, and so um, she decided that she needed to put up a label. Um, but one of the pieces that I had was like a, a rocking horse um, that was covered in braille, and she, uh, we wanted to encourage people to, you know, to interact with it, but actually not to ride it. <laughs> so, um, but this, the reason I wanted to start with this slide is because this sort of encapsulates the way that I think about my, my artwork, that um, I feel that the audience, um, they're not so much the audience as that they're participants in, in the object, in interacting with the object and making the object what it is, and that um, it becomes a different item um, every time it's um, interacted with with a new person. So, um, and it sort of becomes a palimpsest in that way. Um, so this was my thesis show at the um, School of the Art Institute of Chicago, and it was a, 
um, and it was a performance installation that I did. It was sort of a duration piece called Trousseau. Um, so this is the kind of work that I was doing before I was diagnosed with um, a degenerative eye condition, um, which kind of thrust me into this whole idea of, you know, what's going to happen when I become blind and I can't, you know, make art anymore? Like, what kind of work do I start to make? So, um, so it, that diagnosis happened right after I did this. So this would have been like in 1995. It's been almost 30 years ago. And this is called Clay Angel. So this was sort of another piece that I was doing at that time. This is a, um, an interactive um, outdoor sculpture um, that is filled with spa quality clay. So people could lay in it and make a clay angel, but come out of it covered in this like white purifying, you know, spa clay. So going from this sort of interactive work to work that actually has more to do with um, literally touching the object and thinking about skins and thinking about exteriors and interiors, I started thinking about Braille. And I started teaching myself Braille, um, thinking, well, if I become a blind artist, you know, the tactility and interaction is going to be of a, a primary um, tool for me. Um, so this is one of the first pieces that I did, um, and this was sold at, at Sotheby's, which was kind of an exciting thing. And it, it um, was, I had two of my friends that were performing in these two suits. And they're gorilla suits, and each of them are covered with um, love poetry in Braille. Um, so, and my friends were, it was a couple, a, a man and, and woman couple, and um, they had been having a fight that day, and they were really reluctant to come and, um, you know, participate in this. But um, after sitting for a couple of hours, like, touching each other and reading the love poetry on each other, they kind of made up. <laughs> so I kind of love that. And then um, right now it's, it's, um, it's in Tel Aviv somewhere. So it's kind of exciting to have you know, that, that piece out in the world and who knows what's going on with it. But text on t of the female suit. So you can see all the braille um, that's been beaded onto the suit. And I think about the little braille beads as, um, as blemishes and uh, how gorillas um, you know, pick they pick the nits and the little bugs off of each other. And it's a form of, of caretaking and caressing. And so I kind of, I like that, that the, the braille was, um, was a surface on the skin. These are details from a piece that I, um, I did at the Octagon here in Ames a couple of years ago. And it's called Light Letters. Um, and I was thinking about, um, using stones, like precious stones and, and diamonds, to represent the braille dots. Um, and I started to apply them onto, let's see, onto trash. Um, and so each one of these items, uh, recyclable items, has a, a different word on it that's been written in diamonds in braille. Um, and it's a quote from Walt Whitman. Um, the art of art, the glory of expression, and the sunshine of the light of letters is simplicity. So that's what, what this reads. Um, and so then moving on, so this is all from the Braille series work. This is a show that I recently did um, a year ago at Grandview University here in Des Moines. It was a solo exhibition called Sense Surrogates. So all the work in this show um, has the Braille beadwork applied onto the surface. And they're all wearable objects or interactive objects. So this is called PET. And um, the beadwork on the, on, well, you can see here a little bit better. Um, so there's the, the Braille beadwork. Um, and uh, it's from a quote by Matthew Arnold. Um, and it reads the joy and the proof over and over and over again. So it's sort of like wearing this, um, this three-dimensional mantra that you can, you know, kind of comfort yourself with. And the original quote by Matthew Arnold, who was, uh, he was an art critic and a poet, a 19th century art critic and poet. Um, and the quote is, to have the sense of creative activity is the great happiness and the great proof of being alive. 
Um, so I see all these as kind of as comfort surrogates to comfort objects. Um, okay, moving on. I think there's another detail. Okay, and this is hide. So um, this is a, a vintage sheep's uh, lambskin jacket that I embroidered the braille beads onto, and there's little um, pearls and things on here as well. Um, and this is the story of uh, Little Red Riding Hood in, in Braille. So I use a lot of nursery rhymes and um, mythology um, and fairy tales referencing that in my work and, and play and um, how play is not just this innocent activity oftentimes, but you know, we, we, um, it's a ritual we, that we enact. So um, there's a detail of some of the pearls and the beads on, uh, on that piece. And this is, shows, this is a detail of the inside. So this kind of shows my process a little bit. So when you're marking, when you're putting the, the braille text onto um, the fabric, you have to do it on the back. So it has to be done backwards and upside down. So that when it reads from the front, it reads properly. Um, so it gets kind of confusing <laughs> when, you're, when you're doing it. Um, but uh, yeah, so. Um, this is called Socks, um, and this was sort of another kind of a playful piece that I made. And again, it's, there's love poetry written on both of the, of the socks, um, and they're just monkey socks. And I was thinking about monkey socks and the little weird little mouth. Um, so that's the one. Okay, and this is called Her Suit. This, so this is a more recent piece, too. This is um, about a, from last summer, last fall that I created, of 2022, that I created this. Um, and it's a giant stuffed lion that um, I tore apart. And the inside is all covered in gold leaf. And it's um, got braille beadwork text on the inside of it. And that's, it's a fairy tale called All Furs, um, which is a story of a, of a princess. And she, um, She's running away because something bad is happening to her. <laughs> and she, um, all of her little woodland friends give her a piece of their fur. So she creates this protective um, cape for herself, and um, which keeps her safe in a sort of a disguise that she's able to, to get away from. But, um, but I was thinking about how lions are so symbolic. Uh, lionesses for women are symbolic of courage and strength, and, um, and, and they're fierce. They're just kind of amazing creatures. So, um, and then I incorporated some um, some gemstones into into this piece as well. Um, and this was actually exhibited here at the Des Moines Arts Center. In um, it was a performative event that I did here about a year ago um, called Occupation: Coax, Coddle, and Caress. So a lot of these Braille series pieces I had here. Um, and models were wearing them, and they were roaming around the galleries, and people could touch them and put them on and interact with them, um, which was fun to do. So this is, shows a detail of the gemstones. And this is the braille that's been beaded on to the inside of the skin. Okay, this is hug. Um, and the braille text on this piece is uh, an excerpt from the Kama Sutra. Um, and again, it's sort of a surrogate friend or comfort, um, comfort object. And this is Hug at the Des Moines Art Center. <laughs> so um, a young friend of mine um, was willing to, to carry it around and, um, and let people you know, touch the beads and stuff. So, and here's Hug with the John Chamberlain sculpture. <laughs> um, and here's a little girl that's um, interacting with a uh, pet that another one of our, uh, another friend of mine was, was wearing. Let's see. And this is a conversation between two poets. So there are a couple of um, leather masks that are covered in uh, love poetry as well. So, and there were two people that were wearing them, so they were reading each other's faces, the lines, literally, you know, on their faces. Um, so, and there's a kind of a detail of that. Um, this is Hush, um, and 
This was made in 2020, so this was my COVID piece, or the way I think about it is my COVID piece. It, it has to do with that idea of um, being separate, you know, and that touching somebody that you love, um, hugging them, getting close to them could mean their death. Um, and I think that, you know, I mean, obviously we're kind of coming out of that, COVID is still with us, but um, the anxiety and the stress and the, the kind of self-isolation that we all felt, um, this was kind of the piece that I made during that time. Um, and it also, um, it's, a, it's a pair of um, rabbit fur glove, vintage glove liners that I pulled out and turned them inside out and they just look like these little mittens. So the braille um, on these, um, there's a, a braille word on each fingertip and it says, I remember how warm your skin used to be. Um, so it also references the, the rabbit skin that was killed to make a pair of gloves. So there's another detail of the fingertips. Um, and it's a wearable piece. And here they are being performed. I, had, I made an extra pair so that I um, could interact with them. These are more shots. Um, and that's black sheep. It's sort of referencing um, like an inner tube or a lifesaver um, or a pool toy. Um, and it's got um, beadwork inside, all the, the braille text inside. Um, so this is sort of a concurrent series that I've started working on. This is an older piece. This is called Wingback. And I was, I made this, um, this is what, one of the first pieces I made when my mother died. And I was kind of obsessing over souls and death and life and spirits and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, I was kind of desperate to be in touch with her and I just missed her. <laughs> and so I ended up, I found this chair and it's, I, the wing back, you know, parts of the chair turned into this literally a pair of wings when I was stripping them stripping them down. So, um, so that's kind of set me on this other direction with the furniture um, and um, my cats, which <laughs> I, um, anybody who lives with cats knows how destructive they can be, you know, with their, <laughs> their furniture. Um, and to me, like, you know, when you're living with another being that is a non-human, um, both you and the, those creatures have to make room for each other, and you make a lot of compromises um, in, you know, in living together. So um, this was a, a, a piece <laughs> that one of my cats made, um, and, and I, you know, she used the end of it was this old, gross. I mean, you recognize this color, right? This is like from. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. From, from the late 60s, early 70s. And, you know, and so, and she was, you know, using the end of it as a scratching post. And then, she, you know, she passed away a couple years later. And I was getting rid of the sofa because it was really disgusting. And, but I, you know, it was part of it that I needed to hang on to because it was, um, she, it was her, you know, and it had so much of her energy and um, her, her adaptation in, in it. Um, so to make it precious for me, I started setting these gemstones into the, and I think of these as kind of wounds too. So, you know, and, and you know, you're digging through the skin and getting to what's inside. So there's this play of like interior, exterior that I started thinking about. Um, and so this piece is upstairs. This is called Scratch. Um, and then I did, and there's, so these are my, this is one of my cats, um, working on um, <laughs> some of the cushions um, for uh, Grotto, that's the pillow fort upstairs. Um, and his name is Mouse, Mousy, and here's Mouse's tail. And so this, this is how I had them set up for him and the other cats to, to scratch on. Um, but yeah, they're kind of working on that. Um, and so then this became, you know, the, the wings again. And um, I, I set the gemstones into the wounds um, to turn it into this kind of a more precious object, but also like, you know, what's inside? Like, I just want to know what's inside. 
um, what's inside of us. Um, so I think of these as relics, too. That's Pip, and so she's working on some of the cushions. I had to get her started a little bit on that one. But, um, okay, and here's the pillow fort. So I don't know if you've seen the, probably some of you have been upstairs and seen this um, in the exhibition. But um, so, and I was, with this piece, um, this is an extension of the cushions and the upholstery and the furniture and the adaptation that, um, that we do with you know, our, our creatures. But also I was thinking about you know, the idea of going into the cave in fairy tales, that, that you, know, you always in a, to transform and to become something greater than what you already are, you have to go through some really bad shit. <laughs> um, and come through it, you know, and um, so going, th so this to me is sort of a representation of that, that it's, it's about play, but it's also about this transformative cocoon type cave that you are going into the well, going into the dark woods. So, um, and what's inside is, um, and that was at the opening, and that's, you may recognize Jeff there with his family. Okay, so this is what's inside. It's all the, the insides of cushions um, and cushion seats that have the springs in them. Um, and so I was tearing those apart and embedding gemstones and all the crap that you find in sofas and chairs. And my friends and I were scouring, you know, the entire state of Iowa looking for, including my friend Lori, <laughs> who did a lot of that for me, um, finding stuff and bringing them over. And, um, because we can't allow people in to it right now, um, I did take a little video of, um, so this is sort of what it's like inside. And it's a three-dimensional space, so there's springs above. It's sort of like being inside of a bed, like inside the springs of the bed. Um, but it's this really kind of cozy hideaway that I think I'm gonna put in my living room when I get done. But, um, so, and this is the piece that I'm working on right now. And this is uh, called Nightfell, and it's a black velvet parachute. Um, and so what is on the parachute is um, the constellations and different astro or astronomical um, uh, forms and shapes, um, but also uh, braille text that tells mythological stories about the different um, constellations and stuff. So the idea is that it's like this collapsed uh, planetarium, kind of. Um, but I was also thinking about, you know, my vision, and because over the past two, three years, my vision has um, gotten much worse. And I've had, an, I think I counted like 27 surgeries in the course of like a year and a half. Um, so uh, I'm thinking about how, um, it, it, it's called night fell. So, you know, how um, losing your vision can feel like, you know, a dark, darkness is coming to you. But how do you transform that into something that's, um, that's interesting and positive and kind of beautiful? So, um, ironically though, doing the beadwork is really hard on, <laughs> on my eyes. So, um, you know, it'll continue to evolve, but um, I think that's it. So, thank you.
Beloved, we are gathered here to celebrate the homegoing of our sister, our friend, and the celebrated artist, Tamika Norris. We offer our condolences to her family, her friends, and to those of us who loved her ever so deeply. Here at Maud Chapel at Yale University, Tamika's own alma mater, we cannot help but notice her absence, which is both deep and great as Tamika has slipped away to be with the Lord. I met Tamika during our Grant Wood residency many years ago at the University of Iowa. She was yet and then already a brilliant artist and I was in awe of her. In fact, y'all, she fed me when I was hungry. She gave me drink when I was thirsty, even when she herself was not well. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. I recall when Christ says, what you do for the least of these, you do unto me. Y'all, Tamika was generous. She was courageous. And you know she was funny as hell. I remember Tamika saying, Chris, if I leave here for you, do you preach my home going service and don't you talk all day like you want to. But y'all know what? I am a truth teller. And so, you know, I've got to tell it. I have got to tell it. Tamika, like so many of our sisters, our daughters and our mothers have been harrowed on to glory by institutional racism, sexism and the weight of being a black woman in America. In Tamika, we have an example of resilience in the face of adversity, every adversity, and I, for one, am sorry to see her go. Yet, from the lectern here at Yale University, I can boldly declare that she shall wear a golden crown. Y'all, she's going to put on her golden crown. She's going to put on her robe in glory. She's going to tell her story of how she got over. She at home, y'all. She at home in a golden crown. In fact, Tamika left for us a living legacy of art, artifacts, exhibitions, and performances of institutional critique. A legacy of what we can do if we face down darkness every day of our lives, if we struggle and if we believe that we shall see the glory, that actually the glory of God, the glory of our living God shall be revealed here on earth and then in heaven. I remember the old hymnal that said, Precious Lord, take her hand, lead her own Lord, let her stand. She was tired. We, we were weak. And she was worn. Through the storm, you know through the storm. Yes, through the night. Lead her on, Lord. 
through the light. Take her hand, precious Lord, and lead her home. You know, in the old sanctified church, we would say, yes, 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 yes. Come on, come on, y'all. Yes, 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 yes. As I see Tamika lying here, y'all, my heart says, my heart says, Lazarus, get up. Get up, Lazarus. Get up. For we love you so. Here today we acknowledge when John the Revelator said, and I heard a voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with men and he will dwell with them. And they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will be no more death, nor mourning, or crying, or pain. For behold, the former things have passed away. And the one seated on the throne said, Behold, I make all things, I make all things, I make all things new. Then he turned to John the Revelator and said, Write this down. For these words are faithful and true. I remember Tamika's performance work, particularly the one in the last, it is the last chapter of the book, uh, Radical Presence. Didn't she make all things new, y'all? Didn't she make all things new? Didn't she? Well, here today we continue her work, both God's work and Tamika's work, till we can say that we are all free at last. We are all free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. But we won't stop. We won't stop till we know that black women have the health care that they, they need, To we know that black women in academia have the support that they need, To we know that neither disease nor mental illness nor famine nor pestilence nor whiteness will wear them down and send them hollering on to their graves. We can stand in the darkness and say we are the light for we remember Micah 6, 8 and what the Lord requires of us. He says, he's told you, oh man, what is good and what the Lord does require of you, but to do justice, to love mercy and to walk humbly with God. But here right now, I got to go back. I've got to go back to she shall wear a golden crown. She will put on her robe in glory. She will tell her story today of how she got over. I know some of her beloved sisters so heartbroken. In fact, we know Tamika's grandmother went on the glory only a few weeks ago herself. But we know that God will wipe away all tears, all tears, no more sorrow, no more pain. And like our old folks used to say, our grandmamas used to say, every day will be howdy, howdy, and never goodbye. Behold, Christ has made all things new, but let us not today act brand new. You know the difference. God made all things new, but let us today not act brand new. Let us instead remain steadfast, or better yet, let steadfastness have its full effect. Can the choir please sing, but we remember Tamika's work today. Go on and raise the choir. Take me to the king. I don't have much to bring. My heart is torn in pieces. It's my offering. Take me to the king. Chasing after 
Thank you both very much for sharing your work. Check. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so yeah, you, you will have to sort of pass the mics around a little bit. So um, I'm going to start with the first question, and TJ, I'm going to let you go first since we haven't heard from you directly, although that was very direct, I think we have. Um, so both of you have performance as a huge element of your work. You're represented here at the Art Center with sculpture, but it's pretty clear from, from Angie's presentation in the video we just saw that the performance and the presence of, of the body of the artist, the body of the audience, all of that is super important. So if you'd both like to talk about that a little bit, that would be great. Thank you. Um, I've not seen the film that big before. Um, so I guess one thing that I'd say is, um, often when I'm asked to give an artist talk, uh, because of the nature of the work, I have to be really careful about my own personal triggers. And so quite often, being able to watch uh, the ecosystem of myself, Tamika, as a part of the ecosystem of a person who I carry with me still, but who has been partially laid to rest because she's worthy of rest and has not been given enough rest in the world. So it's sort of healing in a way to watch this film. It, it gives me many feels, but it's sort of me as the sort of administrator and front person of one of myself. Um, shepherding and ushering and watching um yeah an opportunity like th the ritual the ritual of knowing she is safe there she is she's been laid to rest and it's sort of a you know i would almost say a disassociative sort of experience in a way that i have a lot of therapy and i work closely with my therapist when i produce this work in that um in a lot of ways the embodied practice of getting in the casket you know, over COVID, like, so this was shot at the Figgy, but I had a solo show at the Figgy, but because of the pandemic, there weren't really patrons allowed to come into the show. And it debuted at Illinois State University, that film. And so um, the embodied experience of being able to deal with my own mortality during the pandemic was really important and almost like mental health feeling so precarious that I needed to see it, see it. Like, see it, see it, see it. And that was the healthiest thing that I could do for myself. And when I have a rough day, I cue that video up, and I sit with myself, and I sit with my feelings. And my therapist number is handy if I also need it to. So it's been a beautiful collaborative. I mean, the work is really collaborative in that I'm working with ancestors. I'm working with curators who help me shepherd and usher my mother's belongings and, and my previous selves' belongings into spaces. So performative, but also very embodied for my own knowledge and healing. Thank you. <laughs> Can you um, just, just sort of talk, I mean, you talked about performance, but I think, get, and also I'm sort of just going to add performance. I guess you guys do, both do performance, but you both do really vulnerable performance. You didn't use that word, but it is vulnerable and it is bringing, it's asking, in your case, asking people to be vulnerable, um, but also relating to your own body. So if you just sort of want to expand about, I guess, the importance of performance in your, your practice overall and, and the body. Um, yeah, and in terms of um, performance, um, I think that the first piece that I showed you, um, that was one of my first sort of, ex one of my first experiments with um, actually um, the, the, the interaction with the material and the, um, what was left um, was what was interesting about the piece, that it was, that, um, 
the detritus, I guess, of, um, of, of doing, doing something, um, performing a ritual or whatever, that that's the stuff that was, is interesting to me in terms of the body um, and the body with artwork. Um, so m most of my, st there we go, most of my work is, um, it's based on um, having a history and craft and creating things that are functional. Um, and thinking of it as going one step further with that, and well, okay, so what is metaphorical function about, um, you know, in terms of art? So um, having a history in theater, um, a lot of the things that we create for theater, um, uh, they're, they, they're not actually functional, like the coffee mug that sits on, you know, the, the, the table, you know, it's, um, it's not being used to drink from, it, it, that coffee mug has another um, symbolism, it means something else, so it's something more than just the coffee mug. So um, when I think about objects and their function in that way, um, I think about how people interact with things and how an object can, can kind of absorb the energy from a, a person. Um, and the object starts to tell its own story. And, and we all kind of know that with, you know, going to thrift stores and looking at, or, or how precious our child's first, you know, little outfit is, you know, that's got stains on it. Or, you know, like, I remember when they spilled ketchup on that. Or, I, I love all that stuff. I think it, it all enriches the work. So, um, when, so I encourage interaction with my work, and I, I, I don't want it to be precious. Like, I don't want it to just be something on a pedestal that you can't have a relationship with, um, because those objects affect us as well, and they change us. Um, and I think that like closing that gap between the art object and the, the person um, is, is really exciting for me. Um, so it's not so much performance as it is like real. You know, it's not performed, it's really happening. It's just the, the objects are the vehicle for that. Yeah, yeah, it's like a raw material to see like how does somebody interact with this. And I think that's where the cat thing comes from too. Like, okay, if I provide this object or this thing to them, like what are they gonna do with it? How will they see it? So I, have, I actually have a pet question for both of you too. And I, this is, you know, when we talk about, you know, people laugh and, and people that, but I know, and obviously you talked about the cats. I know you have pets that are very important to you. And I feel like that, especially in times that have been hard, it is a serious relationship and it is important to who we are as our well-being, our relationship with our pets. Um, and it's one that, is, yeah, we, 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 people, like there's the idea that you're not supposed to, serious yet it's in some cases some of the most serious emotional <laughs> responses and relationships we have um i mean like when you were talking about that work i almost started to get sad about pets that i you know your pet looks like a pet that i lost and i thought about things that i have and i know you have a very close relationship with your dogs do you want to talk about that a little bit yes <laughs> um i am a first time pup mom like independently of like other family having dogs or like my you know home pets like my own and I got uh Adkins my first mini poodle uh when I got here um and he's an apricot mini poodle and named after the artist Terry Adkins if anybody's familiar with Terry Adkins who was a dear mentor and friend of mine um and strangely and so then so Adkins got imbued with the spirit of Terry Adkins. So this dog is very smart. He's also a narcissist and um, a prankster. Uh, and he has his own emotional ecosystem. And I had to learn, you know, I'm, the bo I'm like a boss bee in my world. In some, in some world, I've created for myself. But sort of I'm at the mercy of these beautiful little creatures that I've brought into my life. So Adkins, I realized, needed like almost an emotional support animal himself. So I got Rosie, another smaller mini poodle, um, because she just has a chill temperament. She's just like your regular basic lap dog. He did not provide me, so I could think, this is the crux of it, I, I had needs that I wanted met <laughs> from 
th from this dog and he was not willing to play along and I was confused about like and I guess that might be like having children you don't know what the personality of your child is you just have to work with what you got right like maybe, maybe a bad comparison but um, so I, and I also really feel like during the pandemic they they really saved me um, the kind of conversations I was able to have with my dogs that's just that closeness that warmth like you know, full disclosure, during the pandemic, my mother and grandmother died within six months of each other. I got a divorce in the middle of all of that, too. There was a derecho. It was a rough little couple of years for your girl out here in these Iowa streets. And my two dogs literally were the relationship that I cultivated with them and watching Adkins actually have this other sweet, carefree dog to connect to. It was beautiful to watch their relationship. Um, and it's just been, it's been something that's changed my, my life. Like my, my radar back to home, my pull back to home, like even today, I'm like two hours from my house and I'm like, I can't wait to get back home. And the ritual that I have with them kept me busy too, just during the pandemic, feeling really alone. Like I had to get out of bed to feed them. I had to go walk them. And sometimes that was the only thing that kept me like going. So we can talk about pups. We can talk about animals all day. Well, I mean, I, I like talking about it in terms, you know, the, 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 I reached out to Ange about the work because another artist friend had talked about you working with cats and knew that I was working with cats. And when I went and visit you in your studio, um, if doing studio visits can be kind of weird. Like you're going into someone's personal workspace and you're going to be asking serious questions about their art. And, I, you know, I knew your art's really personal. And I've done a lot of studio visits, but you don't really know what that dynamic is going to be. And so when I got to your studio and you have these dogs, it's like this immediate icebreaker that we, like it makes the conversation easier. The dogs are there and I it makes me more comfortable because I'm an animal person. So they're, all the pets are the sort of patron saints of this exhibition, I think. I also think it just keeps my Leo Virgo vibes. Like I'm not in control. Adkins will just poop a turn. Like he'll, he'll just do whatever he wants. So it's like, it's, it's that level of like- Chaos into the chaos. world. I am, on, I am on their agenda, which is actually really humbling. And I really appreciate, it keeps me sort of level. <laughs> that like it's all about the kibble and the food and watching poop consistencies <laughs> as like a, you know, sorry. This is a show about domestic space, so here we go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for me, I, I, I think it's really interesting to see how, what you were just talking about, TJ, is um, how animals, like how we change and adapt to our animals. Like that and that relationship that it's not just, you know, them, like it's not just us taking care of them, and, but they affect us and they change us too in a really deep way. Um, and I, I find that kind of interspecial relationship really, really interesting that, you know, what happens to us when we engage in that? Do we become more animal or, more, or, or wilder, maybe not? Because we are animals, but do we become, become wilder ourselves and more fundamental? And for me, like you were talking about with, um, uh, you know, it's something to, you know, get you up in the morning. Like, you know, it, it helps you to just kind of stay it, on this level that, on a, on a level, on a, a levity is what I think of it as, you know, it's a lightness. Um, and yeah, I mean, they, they keep me from going all the way down they keep me like buoyed i guess is a good word yeah i think too, i mean there a lot of the work in this exhibition the work on the exhibition from my point of view but from the other artists was made during 2020 forward and people had personal issues people the world had issues and it was a tough time and i there is a reason why so many people adopted um it during that time and i do i do think it's those those interspecies relationships are important and, and we it's you should talk about it. Um, you mentioned the derecho. Um, that's not the best thing about Iowa, but I am going to bring up Iowa. So you, bo you both also have worked, you worked, you both spent a lot of time either in school or working outside of Iowa, working in art ecosystems outside of Iowa, both internationally, nationally, but you also now both, both live here and work in Iowa. Um, and that's can be good, bad, ugly, and all sorts of things. But um, would you, do you mind since we're Iowa artists here talking a little bit about what it's like to work in Iowa? I was born and raised um, in Sheraton, which is a rural community um, about an hour south of here. And, uh, you know, 
the minute that I graduated, I was out. Um, and I went, you know, went to undergrad at UNI um, and then ended up in Italy. And I lived in Italy on and off for about five years. I was working for an art school there. So getting out of the Midwest and being in one of the most beautiful places on the planet um, was just heaven. And the way that people, for, my experience in Italy and with the Italian people is that they live so, they're, they're able to live in the past and the present and the future all at the same time because they're surrounded by history. So, and then moving directly from Florence to Chicago was such a culture shock for me because I hadn't ever really lived in a big city like Chicago. I'd lived in Minneapolis for a while, but that's, you know, Chicago's something else. And, um, and that's when I started grad school. And um, moving back to Iowa, my, my mother passed away, which, you know, makes our lives crazy. Um, when we lose family members, things can really go bad. So um, I moved um, back to Sheraton, and because um, my dad is there. Um, and he's in his mid to late 80s right now, um, which has been really great. And I, I think in terms of my practice, um, going back to my roots and my, my dad still lives in our childhood home. I mean, he built the house that, um, you know, when I was four years old and he still lives there. So um, I'm really grateful to have those kinds of roots, like our animals are all buried in the backyard, right? <laughs> From, you know, 50 years of, of animals are all back there. So, um, but I like, nature is one of the things that I missed about um, living in Chicago, is having direct contact to nature, about having a yard, um, owning my own house. I never owned property before, I always rented. You know, I never had a car. I took, you know, the L and the subway everywhere and buses and, um, so all of that um, and having immediate access to wilderness um, was, was huge for me. Um, and just, it's cheaper to live here. Like you can, you know, I can make art here. It's quieter, there's um, a lot less going on. Um, so I can spend my time like making art and, um, and it's just, it's wonderful. Um, my whole, my how, I think that was another question you had on here was in terms of our, um, our, uh, like our studio or where we work. Um, and my whole house is, is my studio. Like I work on my bed, I work in the kitchen, I work on my front porch, I work in my living room. And um, it's just, and I, and it's mine. Like, you know, I own it. So I don't have to rent an apartment and worry about, pounding nails at 3 a.m. and bothering the neighbors, because I can do that now. So, yeah, so moving here, being in Iowa is, is fantastic, and the opportunities, I, I was really amazed and surprised to see such a vibrant art community here, and that has just been so exciting for me, so. Yeah. I love that. Speaking of home ownership, similar. So I um, grew up, uh, in the southern region in Louisiana, Mississippi. My family was also military, so I've bounced around a bunch. Um, I got here in 2016 and was intended to be here for a year as a fellow, a Grantwood fellow. So my logic was one academic year at the University of Iowa, blow my whole load. The only black tenured and queer identified professor in the whole school, in the history of the school. That's another story. Um, and wanted to, and just thought like that's one way to engage the site, just go full on and then bounce and give it, make it everybody else's problem to clean up the mess that I've just made. Uh, unfor unfortunately, fortunately, there was a tenure track search during my fellowship, which I got, so I got the tenure track job. Went on to move to Cedar Rapids, purchased homes for the first time, doing the Amer a lot of the like first American dream type things. Bought a $75,000 home in the Red Line Historical District of Cedar Rapids where the plumbing was always jacked up because there was corrosion underground. But that's another story. Um, but what, what, what I think is interesting that I've learned about being here, this is my eighth academic year at the school, 
I've learned that um, with things like legislation and institutional environments that I may have overstayed my gosh darn welcome. Truly, and, and that's okay. Um, and I've learned that like, I need, I, I need a bigger drug. So making art is not doing the work that I need to do. I'm learning. Um, and it's really frustrating because I've worked my whole life. Okay, I'm not, stop it, I'm not gonna get emotional. You're over there signifying, you're gonna get me emotional up in here, stop that. Um, I have had a revelation since this show actually, because uncanny things happen with the work that I can't plan. Like, I was really distraught when I was installing, touching these psychic objects that had been put away for a long time. I wasn't feeling well. My job was, it's just been a, it's, there's been a lot going on in institutional settings with pushback on DEI, and we know all these Iowa politics. Um, so I'm sort of like red flagged as like a problem in general. At least that's how I interpret my presence. Um, so while we were installing, I walked into a cyclothon for the American Heart Association. And for me, it was just very symbolic. My mother and grandmother both died. Uh, symptoms of COVID and other chronic illness, but their heart was a part of it. So I just happened to be loitering around and find the cyclothon right here in town. And I cycle 20 something miles and I'm just crying the whole time. And there's these bro dudes with signs going, ride harder, yeah. And they're drinking, there's booze involved, but I'm having this whole other like existential, beautiful crisis grieving my family. And think, but these uncanny things happen that I can't plan, which has led me to, I think I'm leaving my job, y'all, and I'm gonna apply for an MA to PhD in kinesiology. I really wanna think about the impacts of, you know, like I work in these communities and I do this performative work, but like, what is the impact of like late, st late stage capitalism? What is the impact of like the labor on my body trying to produce this work for the art world? What is the impact of the institution not giving me the resources that I need to produce this work? What is the impact of my legacy as a black queer artist not being that of my white male counterpart? And when I do die and go in that casket and my two dogs are my only legacy, where's it all gonna go? So I'm just feeling like while I love making objects, the real connection for me for the work is this sort of like human scientist element of the things that happen when I meet people and engage with people. And I want to think about the impacts of my own PTSD, not in relationship to the work and it going to a gallery and me getting a check because some rich white person bought it, which I appreciate, but I also need to be very realistic about sustaining this practice how long can i make this work that is sort of gutting me emotionally it heals too but it also guts me so i need to figure out where i belong and i need science money art money ain't doing it i want some research money to figure out what's really happening in communities that i'm passionate about I wanna know what the impact of the mental health of black women and queer folks that have these tenure track jobs and the retention is not there to keep them. Where do they go? What resources do they have? I am my own case study and I'm gonna fuck around and find out with a PhD. So that's my plan. Well, if, Sorry, that was you know, the F-bomb that we talked about I, I said happening she could have or as not many happening. many F-bombs as she wanted. And I also, I, 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 the University of Iowa would Absolutely. I've had the pleasure of meeting some of your students, and they are amazing students, and clearly you have been great for them. So I love my Iowa students. does not deserve you. Thank you. No, I, I, lo I love my students. It, it's, it's a tough decision, but I, I'm just at a, I'm at a crossroads, clearly, because it does feel urgent. It does feel like life or death for me in a certain way. So, so no, that's... Um, I want to make sure, Jill, how are we on time? I want to make sure that we have some time for our audience questions. If you have one more question, then we can open it up. Well, the, the sort of, uh, Angie answered this a little bit, but I, because of the, the exhibition is around sort of space and domestic space, um, just sort of what's, uh, you, what is your, do you work mostly in the studio or do you have studio space at home too? It's a couple of things. So, I, so for example, something like editing of a film. I'm working with editors remotely. They can be anywhere in the world and I'm somewhere else. So I'll have an editing thing going one place. I have stuff that happens in my house or in my kitchen or in my bed. 
I have. The institution provides studio space, like you came to, to the school and saw all the stuff there. So there's lots of different paces of things that happen, fast and slow speeds, and some things that happen on site. And I go to, actually, I go to the Mass Mocha residency in Boston in a couple of weeks, and um, I'm just bringing watercolor paper and markers, and I'll do some, like, I'll do some really, like, horrible admin work, but in, like, a nice environment. So, you know, it, it kind of moves around. Okay. So now we can take some questions from the audience. Or Ange, did you want to add anything to? She kind of talked about her house, so I wanted to make sure both. Okay, sounds good. All right. So, audience, do you have questions for our guests? And I can get things. Oh, I see we've got, got one here. So, Paul will come down, and there's one on this side over here. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. I thought you both did a wonderful job. Um, if I would be interested in hearing, like, in maybe three or four adjectives, what each of you, the impressions each of you had with each other's work. Can you do that briefly? Good question. Good question. Well, my, the first thing that comes to mind when I saw, because I, I started watching her video, their, their, sorry, their, their video a um, uh, couple days ago when um, it was sent out, and um, I, it just, it blew me away. And I thought, this isn't an adjective, I'm not using an adjective. Okay, I'll keep it to the adjectives. Vulnerable, brilliant, um, heavy, and um, inspired. Good. I'm smart, but might not get all these adjectives. Um, yeah, no, these aren't going to be all adjectives. Uh, well, phallic. Uh, the fort. This could be projection, but phallic. Um, like slow building arc of narrative, not an adjective, but that was my experience, um, and play. And there's another word, like, t not an adjective, like, ten tension. These are, this is, it's my, it's my, it's like, I just, I think it's my, it's, it's the, it's that, it's the, so we were talking about going through, like, getting over or going through, and it symbolizes like, yeah, like, am I ready? Like, am I ready to go through? It does this thing to me psychically. So those weren't adjectives, but. Mm -hmm. um, I, seeing your video from beginning to end now and seeing your work upstairs and stuff and hearing you talk about it, um, I'm sort of now, like, I'm, I'm seeing relationships between your work and my work. And a lot of it for both of us has to do with transformation. Like there's a transfer, serious transformation. I mean, obviously with you, you're, you're, you know, you've transformed your entire psyche, you know, and made a, a switch um, and, you know, getting rid of baggage and whatever baggage that is. Um, and I kind of work the same way. I mean, in terms of like, how is this, what, what is my ritual object that I can use to transform um, my, my life, you know, or somebody else's life? Um, what do I need? Like, what is this, what is the thing that I need in my life that doesn't exist anywhere else? And, you know, can I make that thing? What is that thing? Well, maybe it's a gorilla suit covered in, you know, beads or a giant, pillow fort, <laughs> you know, or whatever. Um, but yeah, but doing that transformation via an interaction with. That's actually what I, was, I we, we, we put you guys together because you're both from Iowa. Um, but when we, when you were, you know, your presentations, I was thinking there is so much that's similar, like just, especially you talking about the grotto and I just watched your video and sort of the, the journey that plays out on your face. I was like, this is wild that this is 
the, the, your works have a lot of things going on. I think it's also how people bear witness. There's a, a proximity, like literally how many people can fit in the, in the cave or in the thing. And it's, it's the, that interpersonal thing that starts to happen. Yes. Yeah. Oh, see? Now you can't unsee it. You can't undo that. You can't undo that. Um, yeah, so I think that as well. I, so excuse my, my voice, um, I'm losing it. I, when I first saw uh, both of your pieces, they really took my breath away, I just wanna say that. The fort, I just wanted to crawl into it and just take a nap, <laughs> like, it's like a cozy hug. And TJ, your piece, it almost brought me to tears because I have a lot of friends and people that are like, in that sandwich generation, we're all stressed out, we're taking care of kids, our parents and our grandparents, our healths are failing, and you're losing people. And um, what I really liked about both of your pieces is kind of that tactile element. I really wanted to touch things, and I know we're not supposed to, but talking about the preciousness, right? So I love mixed media pieces, and I'm curious for both of you, um, have you ever had something in your hands and you, you see the vision, but you're, the idea of like stuff and the meaning that we attach to it that you talked about, have you ever had something that you're like, maybe it's too precious, I can't rip it apart, I can't cut it, I can't? In short, I'll just say, like, the, what that brings up for me is thinking about, like, my mom's estate, a.k.a. the hoard that I had to clean up, you know, during my mother's illness and getting to know her through that process. So the difference of being in, you know, a, a 65 year old woman's apartment who's recently divorced and mental health is precarious and going through things feels very different than those same objects being um, with assistance put in proper filing cap you know filing cabinets and then put into my studio so I've had to do things like how I interact with the object does that thing to me so I've had to take on actions such as um, how they're boxed, how they're labeled, the containers they're in, like they're not in the, con like some of the papers aren't in the original container that my mother had them in. So I rebox them and it's just one way for me to give myself some psychic space um, between how I'm even approaching the object to understand if it's too precious or not. Does that make sense? So just how sight and context for me really determines. So like when I was opening up the bubble wrap, like I'm like, ooh, next time I need an assistant, like I need somebody with gloves on and I'll just point and tell them where to put it. Like it's hard, like it was really hard, but I also miss my mom and wanted to touch the object. So there's a push and pull um, and I'm still trying to figure that out, how things, come and go within the ecosystem of my practice. Um, I, I think of the, for me, a precious object is, is a relic. Like you were talking about your mom's estate. Um, and I, I have all that stuff to, I have a broken rosary of my mom's that I remember her using and fingering over and over and over again. And, and I made a little reliquary for it and it's this precious, beautiful thing. Um, so I, I so for me, that's the precious things are the things that are imbued with um, memory and history, and you know the the handkerchief that's like got holes in it and you know stains on it from who knows what. Um, but um, on the other hand, like when my when my mom passed, so um, I going through her stuff and realizing like she saved all this beautiful stuff and i'm sure most of you know exactly what i'm talking about saving their beautiful china for someday saving the beautiful clothes for someday saving you know whatever don't use it don't touch it don't you know and and all the projects that she started that she never finished and and i it just like i realized that and then she dies, you know, and all that beautiful stuff that she had that she never used um, will never get used. Or like, and I don't, you know, I have it now. I'm not really sure what I am going to do with it. But um, so that idea of preciousness, it becomes precious when it's used.
that's it for me, that it's got to go through that use process um, for it to be precious. Otherwise, you know, like the, the work that I had at, in occupation here, um, a lot of that stuff got trashed, the, the Braille wearables, you know, um, because people were, they were on the floor and Jill was, <laughs> we had her, you know, kicking her, her feet up on one of them and, um, and, and, and I just loved that because it's like, okay, that, is the thing that happened when I did that show. And that's the thing that happened when I did that other show. And then you mend them. And then you do the, what's it called? The Tatsuki? Is that, is that the Japanese? Tsukuroi. What is it? Tsukuroi with the Kins gold. Kins yeah. Sugi. Kintsugi. Yeah. yeah. The, where, you know, the piece of pottery is cracked and they fill it with the Japanese tradition of filling that with, with gold and, and, you know, doing that with some... I, I, th I, I mean, it's such a beautiful thing. It's such a beautiful idea. So, um, so that's it for me. I, I, precious is, it's precious when it's trash at that point. We'll have time for one more question if anybody wants to raise their hand. Yeah. Uh, first, I just want to thank you both so much for sharing your work with us. Um, and TJ, I, I hope you don't mind, I have sort of a, a two-part question. Um, you talked uh, about how, you're, how you work with collaborators, whether it's ancestors, your therapist. I was curious if the, the, um, the overdub, the eulogy in your film was a collaboration, and I was curious if uh, you were eulogizing a certain version or part of yourself with that eulogy. Thank you for asking that. Oh my gosh. Uh, so Christopher Rashid McMillan gave the eulogy, who uh, was also a Grantwood Fellow the year that I started at University of Iowa. So we were essentially like roommates. We lived in the same artist residency. And Christopher is a gay black male coming from religious studies and dance and loves him some Jesus. And that's very complicated. <laughs> and so uh, really during that, during that year, Chris would come up and I would make coffee and we really communed. A big part of us getting to know one another and love one another um, was us just spending that time together. And um, both of us arriving new in Iowa as black queer folk being like, what did we just sign up for? Uh, that we had a lot of deep talk. So the day that I wrote an email to Chris saying, hey, I'm doing this performance project. And we talked about death and we've talked a lot about our mental health and talked a lot about the things that we'd gone through and made jokes. Like I, I really did say to him, I'm like, man, if I, if, I, if, if, if I don't make it through all of this crazy stuff, do my eulogy. And I'm like, but don't talk all day. And we kind of made jokes about it. So I commissioned I commissioned the text, but for me, it's been a life, like it's not just that that project was a collaboration. Our relationship is the collaboration. And that was a real eulogy written with whole chest and heart. And I know it was difficult for him to write. He almost refused to do it. Like, like almost like, what are your plans, girl? I'm like, this is like, no, no, I, I, I think, but it, it's a fair question. Like, like, what is my intent? What is this for? Um, so, so yeah, so Christopher Rashid McMillan, is the only person I could have imagined doing it. And just for the record, because there's so much about like God, like we're in Iowa, but there's also some irony of like play with like, does the God that I'm talking about in this film even love me or whatever? And kind of trolling like the two songs that I use, the, um, uh, oh my gosh, the Tamala Man, uh, Take Me to the King song was a song that when my aunt was in hospice and I just moved back home after grad school. So the first big family event that I went to like post grad school was my aunt's hospice and they have a little boom box and they just keep replaying Take Me to the King like 40 times while she's dying. And it's like, it's, and I'm, I'm not joking. She had this moment where her body, and if anybody's ever seen someone go through this process, she heard her, her daughter's voice uh, cry in the room and her body just shot upright stiff. And it was just so profoundly amazing to watch this woman give 
the last stretch of everything she had. Like while we're like goofily listening to this song repeatedly on a boom box. Um, and then my mom, who's like having a whole mental health crisis because her sister's dying and just her own crisis is asking her sister if she wants a hamburger, like trying to distract death from her. And I make a painting about that, that that's also in the show, but like, so yeah, so just the notion of like making this film and using these songs, like th there's all these things that maybe the audience wouldn't know, but there are, there is some like dark humor in like why I chose the songs that I chose and what it was sort of reminding me of. And my sort of upright negotiation was me sort of thinking through what my aunt was going through while she was actively dying. Um, so yeah, and Chris, yeah, my colleague who wrote that beautiful eulogy for me. I was going to ask what he was going to say. <laughs> no. So, and the other thing was, he was at Yale doing a fellowship. So he was at my alma mater, at their religious studies thing, doing something, recording that at a church at Yale, and just sent me the recording after the fact. And I dubbed the recording into visuals that I had sent to him. And we just kind of worked all the editing out from there. All right, everyone, th please join us in thanking our guests for coming today. Thank you so much, TJ and Ange and Laura.